Good morning, everyone. We will be starting in just a moment here. I see that people are joining and we'll be ready to start off shortly. Great. <clears throat> well, welcome everyone to Harnessing the Power of Water Efficiency and Reuse, an official side event of the historic UN 2023 Water Conference with attendees, attendees from the United States, as well as from across the globe, including Australia, Cambodia, Denmark, Jordan, and Zimbabwe, to name a few. We hope that today's webinar will provide compelling insights about how water efficiency and reuse contribute to greater water security and resilience, regardless of where in the world you call home. Today's webinar will be recorded and all slides will be available following the presentation. My name is Shannon Spurlock and I'm a senior researcher of public policy and practice uptake at the Pacific Institute. I will be moderating our panel today and for the next hour, we will explore how the complementary strategies of water efficiency and reuse, underscored by an, an unwavering commitment to water and climate equity, can build longer term water resilience, reduce water scarcity, protect and restore ecosystems, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. On the next slide, we will go ahead and highlight a few things about the Pacific Institute for those of you who may be less familiar with our organization. We were founded in 1987 and we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan global research think tank focused on water. For the last 35 years, we have created and advanced solutions to the world's most pressing water challenges. And we do recognize that climate change is also water change and the Pacific Institute has thus set a 2030 organizational goal to catalyze the transformation to water resilience. In the next slide, you will see a brief overview of our agenda. As we move through the presentations, please feel free to use the question and answer function at the bottom of the screen to submit questions to the speakers. As I said earlier, the session is being recorded and all panelists will be muted. At the end of the recording, we will send out the slides and the recording to the participants. For the journalists who have joined us today, please reach out to us at media at PACINS for further in inquiries. Now, as we move on to the next slide, I would like to introduce our panelists. I've already introduced myself, and now I would like to introduce our first presenter, Heather Cooley. She is the Director of Research at the Pacific Institute, where she coordinates a team focused on water efficiency and reuse, nature-based solutions, and water and climate equity. Prior to joining the Pacific Institute, she worked at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory studying climate and land use change. She has co-authored dozens of books and journal articles and received the Outstanding Achievement Award by the United States Environmental Protection Agency and Environmental Contribution of the Year by Global Water Intelligence. Following Heather, Dr. Sharon Napier will be presenting. She is the National Program Leader for Water Reuse at the United States Environmental Protection Agency. Her, her program is currently leading the implementation of the National Water Reuse Action Plan, also called the RAP, and it is a collaborative of more than 130 partner organizations that work together to advance appropriate water reuse practices in the United States and internationally. Our final presenter and panelist for this morning's webinar is Dr. Akisa Bari. She has served as the advisor to the Chief of Government, Minister of Agriculture, Water Resources and Fisheries, 
and Secretary of State in charge of water resources in Tunisia. She has worked in water resources management and water reuse in various capacities, such as Professor at the National Agricultural Institute of Tunisia, Coordinator of the African Water Facility at the African Development Bank, Director of Africa at the International Water Management Institute, and as Director of Research at the National Research Institute for Agricultural Engineering, Water, and Forestry. What I'd like to do now is just take a moment to provide a greater context, and we'll move on to the next slide, and we can really think about the intersectionality of Sustainable Development Goal 6 or SDG 6. The UN 2023 Water Conference is a timely and significant opportunity to evaluate our progress in achieving the goals outlined in SDG 6, as well as reaffirm our commitments to advancing water resilience. Water is a finite resource and we all depend on it. And therein lies both the challenge and the opportunity. Due to our interdependence on water, we collectively and globally share the onus to ensure that a safe, reliable water supply is available to provide drinking water, irrigate crops, flow through our rivers, and be resilient enough to adapt to climate change. Water efficiency and reuse are core to the advancement of SDG 6 and inherently promote the adoption and scaling of a multi-benefit approach approach to water resource management. This is key to achieving not only SDG 6, but numerous other sustainable development goals that are reliant upon and interconnected with water. When we incorporate a multi-benefit or co-benefit lens, we gain, the, we gain the greatest benefit out of every drop of water and every resource invested. On the right-hand side of the screen is an infographic developed by the Pacific Institute that highlights a sampling of some, but not all, of the key ways our work supports not only the SDG 6 targets, but the broader 17 sustainable development goals using a multi-benefit or co-benefit approach. On the left-hand side is a recent collaborative report from UN Water which proposes a framework that can be used to improve cooperation between water resource management and water sanitation and hygiene. Moving ahead to the next slide, is we're really taking a quick snapshot look at water efficiency and reuse and its role within SDG 6. Water reuse and efficiency are able to substantially reduce the number of people suffering from water scarcity, enhance water quality, protect and restore water-related ecosystems, and reduce energy use among other benefits. When thinking about sustainable development, it is necessary to consider the strategies that are most accessible and ultimately require the fewest inputs. This ensures that a broad variety of communities along the development spectrum will be able to adopt and adapt and implement strategies with minimal burden. Strategies such as leak prevention and upgrading to higher efficiency products and appliances are often the least expensive and most widely and readily available opportunities to advance water efficiency. Water reuse is an opportunity to ensure that water is never wasted, but always viewed and stewarded as a valuable resource. Through centralized and decentralized applications, water recycling helps mitigate water security at all scales, from mega cities to rural communities to singular businesses and residences. And this slide really, I, what I'm wanting to communicate is on the left side, the universal effectiveness of water efficiency and how it's heralded as a winning strategy by the United States Environmental Agency, the government of Singapore, of Australia, as the sampling of a few. And then on the right side, um, in 2017, the UN published a really beautiful report to really emphasize the importance of water recycling and how it is a valuable resource to address many of the challenges that we face. Finally, in my final slide, before we move it on to our next speak to our panelists, we really want to underscore everything with an approach that highlights water and climate equity. Integrating a multi-benefit approach to the planning, development, and implementation of water resilience strategies results in cross-cutting benefits 
and when executed with the centering of water and climate equity reflects the experiences and needs of the key stakeholders and end users. With this overview, I've given a very high level perspective of how water efficiency and reuse advance SDG 6. To provide more details about what this looks like in practice across states, countries, and globally, I'm happy to hand it off to our first presenter, Heather Cooley. Heather? Thank you, Shannon. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, in the following slides, uh, I will use uh, California as a case study uh, and to, to talk about the potential for water efficiency or reuse and the opportunities that these strategies provide to help meet our water goals and our, and our uh, other community and societal goals. So why a California case study? California is a large uh, and diverse state. Uh, it's home to 40 million people, about half of which live in the, in the greater Los Angeles area, which is considered a megacity by global standards. Cal California also, though, has very rural areas uh, and many water systems, frankly, that are serving just a handful of people. California has a large and robust economy, um, but it also has significant uh, socio socioeconomic disparities. Um, those resources tend to be concentrated uh, and there are many individuals, communities, uh, and regions that struggle to afford basic needs. California also has a highly varied hydrology. Um, we have very, very wet regions in the northern part of the state and desert regions in the south. Um, we have very wet years like this year, but we're also prone to long periods of extended droughts. Um, and as a result of that, we've built a very massive system of, as was shown on the right, federal, state, and local water projects to move and store water from where and when it's available to where and when it's needed. Um, at the same time, California uh, has a lot of sort of a, a diverse set of related water challenges. Um, our rivers and our streams are overtapped. Our aquif aquifers are also overtapped and are declining. Um, some areas have persistent flooding. Uh, we're seeing declining ecosystem health across the state. Pollution, the emerging contaminants are a growing concern. Um, there is today nearly 1 million people that lack access to clean water and many more who can't afford basic water service. And climate change impacts are intensifying. So the diversity um, of California and its struggles uh, with many of the same sorts of challenges faced by communities around the world provides an opportunity to share lessons learned and best practices across geographies. And so while the findings that I'm going to talk about in the following slides are specific to California, the methods can be applied to other areas. Next slide. There's a widespread sort of misconception um, that as, we, as the population and economy grow, we use more water. But the reality is that California experienced a dramatic decoupling between water use and population and economic growth in the past 40 years. As is shown in the figure, prior to about 1980, water use and population were growing at about the same rate. But beginning in around 1980, water use began to stabilize despite continued population and economic growth. And in the period shown here between 1967 and 2018, gross state product grew by a factor of six and the population doubled, while water use increased by just 13%. This decoupling is due to a greater uptake of water efficient devices in homes and businesses and on farms. Um, it's due to the planting and the removal of lawn and the use uh, of more climate appropriate plants. Uh, it's due to denser developments with less outdoor space that needs to be irrigated. And it's due to structural changes in our economy, a shift from a manufacturing uh, economy to a less water intensive service oriented economy. Next slide, please. California is also heavily reliant on rivers and streams and on groundwater, yet we've seen the expansion of some important alternatives like recycled water. Over the past 
50 years, the reuse of municipal wastewater has tripled. Agriculture is still the single largest user of recycled water, though we're seeing an increase in urban areas for non-potable uses like landscape irrigation or for cooling towers and other industrial applications. But we're also seeing an increase for potable applications where communities are treating recycled water and using it to recharge groundwater or to put into surface reservoirs that are then used for drinking water. Next slide. Pacific Institute research released last year identified significant opportunities to build on these successes to further improve urban water use efficiency and develop new local water supplies through the reuse of municipal wastewater and stormwater capture. California, I'll talk first about water efficiency and then I'll talk about the other strategies as well. Um, California has robust water efficiency standards for new developments, including water efficient toilets and fixtures and climate appropriate landscapes. We found that upgrading all homes in California to meet the requirements for new homes, plus modest reductions in commercial, industrial, and institutional water use, could reduce urban water use in California by an additional 30% beyond what we've already achieved. We found that we can go even further by upgrading homes with leading edge technologies uh, and practices that go beyond current standards, um, plus additional savings for other urban sectors. Together, those could reduce urban water use by 48%. So significant opportunities remain um, across our urban areas for water efficiency. And while we've made progress in water reuse, if you look at the middle slide there, we still reuse less than a quarter of the municipal wastewater that's produced in our urbanized areas. Pacific Institute estimates that we could triple our reuse of municipal wastewater again, using existing technologies and practices. So here too, significant opportunities for scaling in communities across the state. Likewise, capturing rainwater and stormwater from our roofs and other hard services could further bolster, bolster local water supplies in dry years, but especially in wet years, as is shown in the figure on the right. I wanna highlight, while this study focused on urban areas, there are additional opportunities in agricultural areas as well for efficiency improvements uh, for, and for reuse of water. So there are, there are opportunities across the state, urban areas, rural areas, uh, agricultural areas as well for building on our past successes and doing more. As you can see in the next slide, um, we find urban water efficiency opportunities uh, across the state. Uh, we can find them inside homes and businesses. We find them outside by transforming our landscapes, moving away from lawns, towards plants and gardens that are more appropriate for California's climate. And we find, as shown on the right, opportunities for fixing leaks in water distribution and delivery systems to further save water. So as we, we look further, we see, again, opportunities across the state, opportunities for all of us to do more to save more. Next slide, please. This, this slide shows the uh, levelized cost of water. So cost is a major factor in prioritizing among the available water supply options. Um, this figure shows the range of capital and operations and maintenance costs for various water supply and efficiency options on a dollar per cubic meter basis. Costs are project specific and we can see quite a bit of variability for any one strategy. But generally, when we look across the various strategies, we find that efficiency improvements are the least expensive option, followed by stormwater capture, brackish desalination, and recycled water. Seawater desalination, as shown on the lower right, is still among the most expensive option available, and many communities find that they are able to provide either demand reductions or, su or supply augmentation through some of these other options at a lower cost. Next slide, please. 
Importantly, water efficiency and reuse not only provide water supply benefits, but they can also provide other important co-benefits for people in nature. Uh, for example, by avoiding new expensive water supply and treatment infrastructure, water efficiency can support affordability. Likewise, transforming our urban lake landscapes uh, from lawns to gardens can help reduce polluted runoff of fertilizers and pesticide and provide habitat for birds and pollinators. Water reuse, for example, can reduce wastewater discharge into sensitive ecosystems, improving water quality and ecosystem health. These co-benefits point to opportunities for partnerships and collaboration, as well as for sharing the cost to implement these strategies. Next slide, please. Energy requirements are an increasingly important consideration, especially as we grapple with the necessity and urgency of reducing energy use and greenhouse gas emissions. Pacific Institute research shows how we can both be both water wise and climate smart. Saving water saves energy and reduces greenhouse gas emissions. We have found that water efficiency is critical for the state and for other regions to meet their energy and greenhouse gas goals. While the production of water reuse and stormwater capture require energy, in some areas we found that replacing energy intensive imported water with these local supply options can help to reduce energy use and greenhouse gas emissions. So an energy benefit there as well. Finally, there's a tremendous amount of energy embedded in wastewater, in fact, more energy than is required to treat it. So as we think about recycling wastewater uh, to provide a water supply, we can also incorporate energy recovery at wastewater facilities to help reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide, please. In summary, uh, ongoing and new challenges mean we must fundamentally change how we use and manage water. We have significant potential to expand water conservation and efficiency efforts, and we can also diversify water supplies, including through water reuse and stormwater capture. These strategies can help us to meet our water and our climate goals, while also providing additional co-benefits for people and for nature. So thank you again for taking the time to be with us today. I'll now hand it off to Sharon Napier from the US Environmental Protection Agency. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks also to the Pacific Institute for organizing today's session. And thanks to Shannon, Heather, and Keisha. It's, a, it's an honor to be on this UN event with you all. So I'm Sharon Napier. I run the Water Reuse Program at the EPA. And today, I'm going to be talking about some of our bigger domestic and US activities to advance reuse. And the biggest collaborative initiative recently is the development of the National Water Reuse Action Plan that Shannon just mentioned, or the RAP as we call it. It was launched in February, 2020, and we're now in year three. And we've just this month released our third year update. You can check it out online and I'll also post a link to it after my chat. Um, I'm gonna be highlighting today some of the big National Water Reuse Action Plan accomplishments over the past year much of which has happened because of collaborations with groups like Pacific Institute. If you are not familiar with the plan, um, this was started really as a platform for collaborative collaborations for advancing reuse, both across the federal government and the water sector. And we now have 135 different organizations that are part of this collaborative. And this is organizations, not people. So this is a very large effort and is continuing to grow. Our ultimate goal is to create these necessary tools and resources so that reuse is easier to implement. And some of these communities like that Heather just spoke about in California, this is not just for our bigger cities, it's also for communities of all sizes so they can access reuse. And if they are in need for an alternative and resilient water supply, the steps to do so is going to be feasible and easy. Third, we focus on funding critical research and technology development. And we, at our, in our reuse program, we focus and work closely with our Office of Research and Development to fund this research that's critical for advancing reuse. We also coordinate our federal government activities across the federal family. We now have an interagency working group, and I'll share more about that in a moment. And one of the big things that we do is communicating curated information early and often. We are now publishing monthly newsletters on action progress, new funding announcements, state regulatory development, and on key research. 
So if you'd like to receive these updates and newsletters, uh, you can email us at waterreuse at epa.gov. I'll also um, drop that link after my talk. We are really trying to grow our reach in our network so everyone has access to the information that needs it. And this is all publicly available so folks in the US and outside the US um, can access this information. In the next slide, I want to show some of the, the metrics um, and highlight that we're really starting to see the impacts of this effort. And I'm so proud of the progress and the consistent growth of this collaborative. So to the folks online that are already part of this collaborative, groups like the Pacific Institute, to those that are continuing to raise your hand and engage with us to create these tools, a big thank you. Um, we now have 62 action commitments. If you're not familiar with the plan, this is a living plan. Again, continuing to grow, and we've almost doubled our commitments since the wrap began. And we're also focused on finalizing a lot of those initial actions. If you're curious about all the different actions within this plan, all of them are posted on our online platform and all of the information on the action leaders, our partners, the key milestones and the outputs that they are created are listed. It was really designed to be very transparent and also to encourage future collaborations. This group has now developed over a hundred different resources. This includes webinars, reports, manuscripts, fact sheets, and other funding announcements. I also want to note that advancing reuse really can't happen with large investments from the federal government. And I have two metrics here that I wanted to highlight. With just within the last year, two of our big federal infrastructure programs, the WIFIA program, which stands for Water Infrastructure Finance Innovation Act, and our state revolving funds or the SRF programs, those have funded 766 million in water reuse infrastructure in the last year. Our partners at the Bureau of Reclamation have also invested 310 million in their Title 16 program and their funding from 2022 has selected uh, water use pro projects that are totaling this amount. Not listed here, but a huge infrastructure investment is also through the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. This is also known as the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. This is providing a large amount of money, 50 billion, that is gonna be flowing through our SRF programs, much of which will be eligible for water reuse, which is very exciting. On the next slide, I'm also gonna be talking, I wanna just point out another thing from the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. We were asked to formalize and, put, and it was putting into statute our Federal Interagency Working Group for Water Reuse. This is really a perfect example of how we're starting to institutionalize water reuse of federal government. And we were tasked in this working group to continue to develop and coordinate on actions and tools and resources to advance reuse across the US and through the implementation of the RAP. So this is formally established in May of 2022. We were given six key duties. We now have 15 federal agencies that are part of this and we owe a report to Congress every two years. So if you'd like to check out more about this interagency group, you can click on this link. In the next slide, I wanna show you the front page of the third year update document that we just released two, two weeks ago. We have um, added highlights within these bins, policy and regs, research funding, infrastructure investments, and communications. We also have buckets related to various key sources and in-use applications. And additionally, through these buckets, we've added relevant new actions so you can see some of the priorities for the coming year. And I'm gonna, in the next slide, start by highlighting some of our biggest accomplishments um, over the past year and let you know about some of these key resources, again, that are publicly available. We have now developed and completed the state content of our tool called the Regulation and In-Use Specifications Explorer or the Reuse Explorer tool. If you're not familiar with this tool, what we've done is compile all of our state regulations for water use. So in the United States, we don't have federal regulations for water use. States are really in the driver's seats. They have a primacy to develop their own water reuse regulations. So we've compiled these state regulations for all sources and now nine in uses. And we've pulled out the specifications, the water quality metrics and the treatment requirements and identify their technical basis. So this is a really great resource for states or even other countries that are trying to understand how to get started with reuse for a particular source or application and they want to make sure that their water is treated appropriately. This can also be useful for industries that are trying to understand how to design a particular treatment technology and make sure that it's removing all the different contaminants. Is it properly removing our bacteria or our viruses or protozoa or different chemicals? So at the bottom on the left picture, you can see that you can search this um, search within this tool three different ways. You can search by state 
our source of water or by in-use application. We provided descriptions of all the sources and those in-uses so you can see how waters have been categorized because across our different state regulations, a lot of our states use very different terms. Once in the tool, you can download Excel spreadsheets on those water quality metrics that I mentioned and compare the information across the states. We also have a maps function and what I'm showing you here is two different end uses. On the far right is a potable, uh, plan potable um, reuse or states that have plan potable reuse regulations and those that have ag agricultural reuse regulations. But this is really able to, you can see the regulation or the regulatory landscape across the US and how it is kind of concentrated, not surprisingly on, in the West Coast. No, we are not including states that do permit reuse on a case-by-case -case basis. This is really compiling those states that do have regulations or guidance documents. If you want to learn more about this particular tool, we do have a demo webinar available on our website to get more details. All right, in the next slide, um, I want to just point out uh, that EPA continues to serve as a convener for our states and our local partners. This is a picture from our recent regulator state summit we had at the Water Reuse Symposium a few weeks ago. We have really remained committed to providing a platform for our various state agencies to have a place to discuss reuse and issues around how to better or more easily implement water reuse. And really fantastic partnerships have now emerged over the last few years with our state association groups. All right, in the next slide, I'm gonna talk about um, I want to highlight some of our research funding. This is a focus of our program, as I mentioned, and since 2020, we have successfully provided small businesses in three million in awards to further innovation on reuse topics such as decentralized onsite, agriculture, reuse within septic systems, monitoring and treatment. We've also had multiple STAR Awards, which stands for Science to Achieve Results Awards, and a National Priorities Grant. And since 2020, we've now funded almost 15 million in, in reuse research. Um, a big special congratulations to the winners of our National Priorities Grant, the Water Research Foundation, and the Iowa State University teams that won that award. There are going to be two additional um, reuse awards in the coming year. One has been closed. It's on Enhanced Aquifer Recharge and Performance. And another um, is on antimicrobial resistance and its removal during treatment. The notice of intent is online and it is anticipated that we'll be opening this announcement within the summer. Okay, and the next slide, um, I wanna show some of our communications um, uh, achievements. It is our goal for our states and communities to more easily access these resources as they are produced. And this month we launched a new resource hub. We have our content organized by nine different in-use applications. You can click on one of nine different cards here and you can find key resources for various types of reuse. We've also linked all of our state summaries from the Reuse Explorer to this site. So if the state has a regulation for that in-use, you're gonna be able to find the reg and our summary of it here. If you go on the site and you see that key resources are missing for our communities, please do feel free to use the link to the page to inform us about content that you think should be included. All right, moving to the next slide. In the spirit of working to connect our smaller communities to opportunities or technologies that include reuse, I wanna highlight one action that Shannon Spurlock, our first speaker, and others are involved in on engaging rural and disadvantaged communities. The real goal of this action is to advance outreach and education about re recycled water usage in communities that have been typically underserved or under-resourced. What this group did was take on multiple engage, engagements and listening sessions with, with members from small communities. They also piloted technical assistance in three of the communities after these listening sessions in the United States. And we do have a forthcoming report on this effort that will be available in the spring on some of these lessons learned from these engagements. And you can see the covered picture here. We can go on to the next slide. There's both a huge need and opportunity in the United States for supporting our smaller systems. In the United States, we categorize our small systems as serving 10,000 or fewer. And perhaps surprisingly, 97% of our systems in the United States are in fact considered small. And most of these systems serve less than 500 people. When the, con when the team conducted listening sessions, you can see the barriers or challenges lifted, list listed here in the bottom left in this bar chart. But some of the big challenges are of course funding, getting this decision maker support, staff, regulatory challenges, or even a lack of technical expertise. 
And based on a variety of these factors, communities are in places or various places along the spectrum of what we might call reuse readiness. Some have more capacity and resources Forces or even motivation, which could be climate driven, to evaluate and pursue reuse than other communities. Okay, in the next slide, I want to um, finally put a plug in for three newly completed documents. These are hot off the press. They were published just in the last month. The first on the far left is how water reuse can create climate resilience in the context of enhanced aquifer recharge and aquifer storage and recovery. We've really focused on treated municipal wastewater in the paper. We do touch on some stormwater, but the focus is on treated municipal wastewater. Second, we released two different infographics on stormwater capture and use and how it can be integrated into the urban environment. So stormwater practitioners can use these graphics to engage with their stakeholders and their decision makers to get buy-in on projects and really show these multi-benefits such as improving water quality and the supply goals. And then finally, on the far right, we just released our trip report summarizing the US delegation to Israel that happened in, in, in October of 2022. This report outlines a five day tour that we took of facilities, largely uh, reusing uh, water or municipal wastewater for agricultural purposes. And the report does um, note lessons learned from Israel's reuse approach. In the final slide here, I, wanna, I want you to. Um, Obviously, you can see that we've had a lot of different activities going on in our water reuse program. We're working across the public and the private sector. Um, one last thank you to all of our RAP collaborative members. This water drop list, all of those are involved within the action plan. Those not involved, feel free to reach out to us and join our listserv for monthly communications, um, or you can use this QR code to uh, join our listserv. I do also want to spend one minute mentioning and speaking to water efficiency in this final slide. We have a flagship program on water efficiency at the EPA called the WaterSense Program. This has a broad range also of organizations, more than 2000 from the public and private sector that are working together to develop specifications for products that are more efficient than standard products. And they are bringing the WaterSense label that's shown here to the marketplace to make it easier to purchase high performing water efficient products. Their vision is that people are going to understand the importance of water efficiency and take actions to reduce their water usage. They have campaigns to help influence behavior change and work with their partners to get those campaigns in front of consumers. So in fact, today is the first day of the 15th annual Fix a Leak, Leak Week. And I encourage you to visit their website to learn more about this program and how it's helping to make a difference in preserving water supplies. Thank you. And now we'll hand it over to Kasia. Thank you, Sharon. And um, I would like first to start by thanking um, the Pacific Institute and US EPA for inviting me to join this event. We started by uh, focusing on California, and I would like to move on, on the uh, to talk about what efficiency and reuse opportunities in Africa, and we're giving also some figures about um, what's happening worldwide. So in the next slide, we'll see how, I mean, the groundwater challenges are first of all about, I mean, the fast growing population on the continent, but also water issues that are, uh, we have about only five water resources that have been developed. Um, the average storage capacity is only 200 cubic meters per person per year compared to four, uh, I mean, to six, 6,100 in North, uh, in North America, 30% of the population without access to safe water, 66% without access to basic sanitation, um, with 88% of all diarrhea cases worldwide, less than 10% of the hydropower potential that has been developed, and about 57% without access to electricity. We have less than 10% of the cultivated land that is irrigated 20% of the population that is facing chronic hunger and a big gap in water infrastructure and limited water development and management capacity. All this is being exacerbated by climate change. And when the continent is only contributing to less than 4% of the global green gas emissions, but it is the most vulnerable region in the world. And we have seven of the 10 most vulnerable countries uh, that are, I mean, to climate shock in the world that are in Africa. In the next slide, we are going to see how, I mean, the um, um, 
you can see, I mean, African uh, cities are growing fast. Cities, we have about 4% rate of urbanization per year. It is the fastest rate, but we have also a high rate of slums with 62% of the urban population in sub-Saharan Africa living in slums. But you can see the document, the, the, the continent is mostly in the dark. I would like also to emphasize, I mean, the gender dimension with a number of uh, women that are really the water providers, water managers, but also um, that are, I mean, without them, I mean, we will be starving on the continent. In the next slide, um, we will, so the, what, what, what is important is really how we can grow blue and grow green by ensuring improved management of water resources and ensuring high quality uh, growth by building resilience to increase water security by a number of, um, uh, uh, of, of things like, uh, you know, enhancing IWM or um, water climate information, developing multi-purpose storage, water supply and sanitation, maximizing water use efficiency with new resource efficient water and energy technologies, multiple use water services, irrigation uh, efficient systems, minimizing water pollution and waste, but and re by resource recovery, reuse and recycling and using alternative water sources and growing green by maximizing natural reuse, resource use efficiency uh, by uh, uh, greening infrastructure, enhanced technologies, improved value chain, minimizing pollution and waste and strengthening resilience to increase uh, water security by intelligent uh, institution, knowledge transfer and so on. In the next, slide, we see a number of, uh, you know, um, water resources that are available on the continent, but uh, some of them are not being used. Uh, these are pictures, some of them are taken from Tunisia, where we are really, I mean, having water scarcity problems, very serious. I mean, storing water in, in dams, or in all kinds of reservoirs, transferring water, tapping in our groundwater and very deep and even fossil aquifers, uh, treating the wastewater, desalinating water. And you can see also on the continent that we are also very much depending on the virtual water. Uh, it is mostly green water that is contributing to 79% of the total virtual water. And uh, I mean, and it is really a very large amount of this. We are importing in the, on the continent about 41,000 billion of cubic meter from, uh, of grain, from grain product, of virtual water from grain products. So it's very significant amount of water that is also contributing to food security that is coming from elsewhere and mostly green water. In the next slide, so there are, we, we need to rethink the storage options and there are a number of storage options along the storage continuum. It's not only in reservoirs or ponds and tanks, but also the soil moisture is a very large, um, um, I mean, uh, we can store a lot of water in the soil and we are not enough paying attention to that, but also natural wetlands and aquifers. But we can also store water not only physically, but non-physically through food uh, storage and management strategy that can contribute to this, to the to storing water. And in the next slide is showing a number of um, water management um, uh, options for um, that have, here it's mostly focusing on agricultural water management intervention that can reduce poverty, increase water productivity and create new and better jobs and that can improve water efficiency and productivity. It can bring more added value per drop. And this is not only in the water sector, in the agricultural sector, but if we think in, other, in the other sectors as well, where we need really how we can have more added value per, crop, per drop. It's, it's very important to look at uh, more holistically in the industrial sector, in the commercial tourism and so on. Next slide. So these are a few examples of uh, water use uh, efficiency that we can, how we are moving uh, on the continent or on, for example, using uh, solar, uh, solar powered systems and uh, also growing, I mean, using uh, hydroponic, um, uh, growing plants through hydroponic systems where we have a high, I mean, and desalinating water with a high uh, efficiency and high water productivity. Next one is also showing, I mean, um, it's about, uh, yeah, how we can better manage water 
at the uh, urban rural interface, how we can make cities more resilient to climate change through integrated urban water management. I like the slides is showing this divide between the rural areas and the cities. I mean, and a lot of water is coming from the rural areas. And so how we can really bridge, I mean, this gap between the rural and the urban areas. Next one. This can be done by using, for example, um, reclaimed water. If we look at, uh, I mean, um, this, this picture is showing, I mean, and you see in red, the untreated wastewater and in blue, the treated one. And the amount of untreated, uh, of domestic wastewater that is been, been being generated worldwide is about 330 uh, cubic, cubic kilometers per year. So a very large amount. And it's only um, about, it's over 80% of the wastewater worldwide that is not collected or treated. When the, and the current capacity is about seven to 10%. So you see the gap in infrastructure all over the world. Next one, and a lot of wastewater that is untreated. So in order to move, because I mean, there are a number of people that are unserved and, and even in the, in the urban areas is how to uh, plan for a citywide uh, inclusive sanitation that will address this problem of uh, equity in service, inclusive planning, take into account the con contextual solutions and address this question of environmental and social justice. So we don't need to have a piped or sewage systems all over, but I mean, we need to have different systems that are adapted to the context, but are, is really addressing the need of the, uh, the answer. And it was addressed in the previous uh, presentation. And I think this is really very important from the point of view of justice and equity. And um, uh, citywide uh, inclusive sanitation can really address this need and provide something that is more complementary, uh, but uh, and uh, 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 and um, with systems that we can a lot of innovation can be also um, provided in these systems where we can complement and have something that is more holistic and more addressing. I mean, and preventing problems of environment and health, environmental problems and health problems. Next one. And must say that sanitation and the new sanitation is really from the point of view of the new circular economy is really very important because this is how we can address, uh, we can also generate and not go out of this, I mean, linear approach and, uh, and uh, produce water, energy, proteins, uh, and different kinds of uh, products. So this um, amount of municipal water that is being generated can irrigate about In the next slide, Oops. so we see also the number of countries with recorded water reuse for irrigation. So there are about 40, 50 million of cubic meter per day of wastewater that are being reused and about 60% is used untreated for irrigation. 20 million of hectares in 50 countries are irrigated mostly with raw wa wastewater. And you know, we have 10% of the global agricultural production that is coming, uh, that is being irrigated with raw wastewater. So we see this problem, this environmental and health problem that really we have to, to address and to see how we can address it through um, the new sanitation and, uh, and different approaches uh, in order to not, I mean, to solve this problem. Next one. So there are a number of benefits, social, economic, and environmental benefits. I, I mo I'm mostly focusing on water reuse, but we need to, to also keep in mind there is all this large amount of wastewater that is being used untreated. And this is also provided benefits to, to a number of people that are, I mean, not being served by these services. So, I mean, and we need really to provide them with 
wastewater treatment in order to be able to reuse safely, I mean, this resource. But we see a number of these uh, benefits like protecting human health, uh, reliable water supply, cost savings, uh, I mean, uh, recovering water, energy, nutrients, large carbon, and so on, and uh, environmental protection. In the next slide, there are some a few examples of uh, systems uh, that I have selected uh, just to give uh, an overview of, I mean, some of this innovation. This is, uh, I mean, in Ghana where, I mean, um, they are mixing um, fecal sludge management and organic waste from uh, markets in order to produce, I mean, energy and bi biofertilizers. So, so it is really quite very interesting, I mean, of things that are being, in, I mean, I have taken this example from Ghana, but they are in another other places as well, and they are selling the electricity to the grid. Next one. And this is from southern part of Tunisia. We have a large system where they are producing um, um, cherry tom tomato and uh, with using solar energy, it is hydroponic product production, um, but, and, and they are, for the time being, using groundwater and desalinated water, but they are planning also to use um, um, reclaimed water that will be uh, treated through sun filters, ultrafiltration, and reverse osmosis to produce this, uh, as I said, cherry tomato that are being um, produced and uh, sold, I mean, in um, exported to the Netherlands. In the next slide, we are going to see another example from Durban, where, I mean, how industry, and it is uh, oil um, that are being using, it is the first BOT, in fact, to treat 10% of the city's wastewater mm -hmm. to portable standards and sell it to industrial customers. And uh, so there, it's about 23% of the city reclaimed water that is being reused by local industries. And this helps to um, provide um, water to additional, it is in fact 400,000 people that are served uh, with a potable water and uh, industries users pay uh, the reclaimed water 50% less than conventional water. So it has really uh, multiple benefits that uh, are being with these systems. And it is a PPP that is with different partners that has been set up. And the next one is about um, uh, wind oak in Namibia, that is the first uh, uh, direct portable reuse plant when, I mean, first of all, producing about 26% of the reclaimed water of the city, but also they are, they are re reusing about 100% of the reclaimed water and the rest is being used for groundwater recharge and irrigation. So these are a few examples of uh, reclaimed water and with, uh, that is being used in different parts of the continent. And in the next slide is about how we can, um, you know, for me, all these systems uh, have to be combined in the cities of the future with, uh, I mean, well, if we take, uh, um, but we need a systems perspective of the all urban uh, water cycle and that by diversifying, by diversifying the water portfolio, we can provide, I mean, additional uh, water resources through water demand management, stormwater, harvesting, um, uh, uh, rainwater reuse, and so on. And this can provide, I mean, a number of options for the city in order to develop, to address the needs of the unserved, uh, for better water efficiency at the same time. So there are different purposes that can be achieved. This is just showing, I mean, the cost of this different system. And with an integrated urban water management system, we have we can have much lower cost than with conventional water, where sometimes we have to bring water from far, far away. In the next one, um, so the, this is how we can move towards water security. Uh, so water and the, through water efficiency and water reuse by integrating these different sources of water, by institutional uh, integration involving all stakeholders uh, and the water partnership, geographic um, integration, governance integration and intersectoral integration. So in the end, I would like to say that we really can improve water efficiency, reduce uh, water waste, increase water productivity and provide opportunities for greater equity and justice. Equity and justice 
They should be put at the heart of the water issue for solving the water crisis and ensure food and sustainable energy security and global public health and transform the way we manage, value, and govern water. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Akisa, and thank you, Heather and Sharon. This concludes the presentation portion of our webinar, and we will now move into the question and answer portion of our webinar. Please use the question and answer function at the bottom of your screen to submit questions for our panelists. And we'll start off with the first question here. And the question is, let's see here. And I'll direct this to you, Heather. Um, are there any efforts to make desal more affordable through the use of microgrids that will bring down the cost of energy necessary for the desal plants? Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, and thank you for the question. Um, I, you know, I, there are a number of, well, first let me start and, and, and really draw attention to the fact that one of the main drivers for the high cost of, of desalination and, and seawater desalination in particular is the energy requirements. Um, and so there have been efforts now for four decades really focused in on trying to reduce energy use as a cost constraint, you know, cost containment mechanism. Um, there's been a lot of uh, improvements that, and advances that we've seen there. Most of the new plants that are being built are using reverse osmosis. Um, that's far more. That's far less energy intensive than thermal desalination, which was which was sort of this the standard approach uh, previously. So there's been a lot of effort around energy recovery. Um, there are also opportunities and, and research focused in on looking at forward osmosis, at using nanotubes, other sorts of technologies that are less energy intensive. Um, and then two, on top of that, there are efforts to uh, uh, try to make it less greenhouse gas intensive by using uh, various types of renewables. Um, and so there's, there's lots of, I think, uh, efforts focused on reducing the energy use and then and then looking at the uh, efforts around reducing the greenhouse gas of that. Microgrids is one strategy for that, but there are many others as, as I've sort of noted. Um, that is a, a main a, a major focus of the sort of research and development around desalination. Thank you so much, Heather. And then Akisa, I will direct this question toward you. There are numerous organizations and businesses that want to assist with resilience and sustainability and cost control, but are unable to provide the systems due to tariffs and complexities in local African governments. The technology is available. How do we cut through that in an equitable way? And then there's a comment, these projects could provide jobs and resources for local economies. Yeah, indeed, it's uh, this problem of um... It's a question of governance. It's a question of making the uh, um, leaders aware and taking into account, I mean, and developing also new policies in order to me to make, um, I mean, that uh, we, in order for funding a new, I mean, to make accessible the market and uh, to make um, these technologies available. So I think that there, there is a need to make them more, better known to establish uh, uh, new partnerships and also to have this, I mean, dialogue between, I mean, these um, different partners that would be, I mean, the, the private sector, these are uh, um, uh, the civil society, the, 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 the policy makers, uh, the scientists and so on in order to make, to be able to make these systems for the decision makers to know what is available, what can be done and, um, and that is also accessible and affordable. So I think that there is, I mean, um, I, I see, for example, I've been working with the African Development Bank, they are doing a lot of efforts, but I mean, there is a need to be done at different levels, I think. And uh, it's it, at the end, it's really the decision makers that will, and the policy makers that are the one who are going to make, um, to take the decision. So they are the one who has to be rich and to make, to, they have to maybe um, aware of what is existing and what the potential and how we can change things on the ground. Great, thank you so much, Akisa. I see we're headed towards time and we'll need to wrap up. So I'm gonna ask one more question and I will direct this toward you, Sharon. Um, and it's as the comment is, 
Thank you for this thoughtful presentation for highlighting the many benefits of conservation and reuse. Can you briefly discuss the roles of local, regional, and national institutions in adopting more conservation and reuse? Goodness. Well, this is what we're this is what we're all working towards. You know, I think there's so many more opportunities um, that remain. I think anything with water reuse and even conservation, we're having to try to tackle this from multiple sides. When we designed our reuse action plan, we had to think about all the different strategic themes or buckets for how we were going to bring people together. So we knew there was technology folks and policy and, and uh, regulation as well um, as communications. And so that's how we ourselves are approaching this huge opportunity. We saw these opportunities even as metrics from, from Heather's slide. Um, in the bill, we're really trying to get a lot of funding um, for infrastructure um, going to some of our small communities, especially and through technical assistance. Um, and we're also trying to promote nature-based solutions that can also help with some of this. Um, one one just last comment I wanna just drop is that we think about this um, in a fit for purpose way. Not all reuse has to involve the same amount of effort and treatment. So if you're treating wastewater all the way to potable, of course, you're gonna need lots of, lots of barriers and permits and buy-in, um, and it's gonna be very energy intensive. But if you're gonna be treating gray water for landscape irrigation, you're gonna need much less. And so not all projects are the same and they can be tackled differently and with different stakeholders. Great, thank you so much, Sharon. And that, given our time, and we're actually about a minute over, we are wrapping up our question and answer portion. And I would like to conclude our present presentation today with a few notes of gratitude. As mentioned earlier, the Pacific Institute is a nonprofit, and we are very thankful for the support of foundations, organizations, and individual donors who make all of this work possible. Thank you to our panelists for this very insightful discussion. And thank you to our audience. We appreciate the questions you've submitted and that you have joined us to highlight, uh, sorry, and to, that you have joined us to kick off our, the, this historic event, the UN 2023 Water Conference. Finally, we hope that this presentation has inspired you, each of you today, to advance these strategies within your own communities. At the conclusion of this presentation, we will be sending out slides as long. We received a, a request for the links that were dropped into the chat. And we will also include those links along with the recording and the slides for this presentation. For the journalists who have joined us, again, we welcome your further inquiries and you can reach out to us at media at pacinst.org. Thank you very much for joining us today. And this concludes our presentation. <laughs>